doing a series, though, about, uh, it's called Stick Together, How to Flourish as a Family. And we're looking at all kinds, of, all aspects of relationships. We're going to look at parenting, marriage, uh, and today that season where you're, you're sort of in the early stages of the relationship. I found an article called Tips on Love from Those Who Should Know. And who they asked were kids, ages 5 through 10. They asked them questions about marriage, love, dating. And here are some of the answers. The first question was this, what do you do on a date? And Mike, age 10, says, on the first date, they just tell each other lies. <laughs> he said, and that usually gets them interested enough to go for a second date. Now, that's a pretty perceptive playa right there, okay? He's not dating my daughter, but good kid. Okay, why do people fall in love? Jan said, no one is sure why it happens, but I heard it has something to do with how you smell. And that is why deodorant is so popular. All right, they asked the question, what age should you get married? And Tom, age five, said, once I'm done with kindergarten, I'm going to find me a wife. That's good. He's prioritizing his education. He's got it good. All right, they asked the same question. How old should you be? And Jean said, 84. Because at that age, you don't work anymore, and you can spend all of your time loving each other in your bedroom. Where are we getting these kids, right? How are these kids figuring out their ideas on love and marriage and relationships? How do you figure out your ideas about love and marriage and relationships? Are you figuring it out from pop culture? You know, that Bruno Mars song that we just sang, that's got, by the way, Bruno Mars has nothing on Jason Harper, am I right? The guy can sing. The guy can sing. But anyway, you know, that Bruno Mars song is on all kinds of YouTube videos and, and, and engagement videos. Have you seen all these elaborate videos where they... Now, here's the word to that song. Did you listen to the lyrics? Because it's a beautiful night, we're looking for something dumb to do. Hey, baby, I think I want to marry you. Who cares if we're trashed, got a pocket full of cash we can blow? If we wake up and you want to break up, that's cool. No, I won't blame you. It was fun, girl. Is that like the epitome of romance for you? Did you grow up thinking happily ever after for about 12 hours? No. You know, I want something more in my relationships, and I bet you do too. So where do we look? We don't look at culture. Do we look at our parents? That would probably work for some of us. I bet our parents got it right in some ways. But there are no perfect parents to look after, and certainly some of us just had some, some bad examples. Our parents didn't talk to each other maybe the way that they should have talked to each other. They didn't date each other or romance each other the way that they probably should have. Maybe they didn't even stay together. And so parents can be a tough resource for us sometimes as well. So here's a novel idea. We're in church. Let's just see what God has to say, all right? We're going to look at the Bible today. Now, some of you go, uh, the Bible, I, I believe in the love your neighbor part, but there's other parts in there I just don't buy. Can I say this? Faith is a journey. Our mission here is to help people take next steps with God. So if you're just here and that's where you're at and you're just checking things out, that's okay. We just hope you'll take a next step with God. And here's the other thing. I know you want better relationships. I mean, that's something I know. And, and, and here's, we'll look at Dr. Phil, and we'll look at Oprah, and we'll look at the counselor on the Today Show. We're just trying to pick whatever wisdom we can to make our relationships better. Let's at least see what God has to say. And here's the deal. If I wanted to find out something about a Ford uh, car, a Ford Fusion, guess who I would talk to? Ford. Because they created it. They're the ones that figured it out. They designed it. If I wanted to figure out a, an appliance, something was wrong, I wanted to get better performance out of it, whatever, I'm going to go to the manufacturer. And can I just say to you, God is the manufacturer. He is the creator. He's the one who made people. He's the one who designed relationships. Marriage was his idea. And so let's see what he has to say. Now, some of you will check out today, and hopefully you haven't already, because you say, well, I'm single. 
What does this have to do with me? Maybe you're widowed or divorced and you're saying, I I just don't get how I'm going to get much out of this. Can I say this? You might hear something today that will help you heal from a past relationship. Might help you process something. You might hear something today that you could pass on to a friend who's in a relationship or to a kid of yours that's going to be in a future relationship. And can I say this? If you're single right now, listen, you don't know what God has in store for you. You say, well, goodness, I mean, I'm, I'm getting up there in age. Listen to this. Uh, this is Forrest Lunsway. This is Rose Pollard. Rose is 90 years old, and this is them getting married on his 100th birthday. So you never know what God's going to do in your future, all right? So here's the deal. We're going to look at our Bibles. Uh, if you have one, open it up. If not, we're going to throw stuff up on the, on the screen. But uh, we're going to look at the Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon. Now, this is one of the poetry books in the Bible, one of the wisdom books. And in fact, this is a song. This is a book of poetry. And it was written by the king of Israel around 1,000 B.C., before Jesus comes on the scene. And this guy is not just an incredible warrior. He's not just a man's man, but he's kind of a renaissance man because he writes songs. And this is one of the ones that sort of stood the test of time. And the, the topic of the song is his detailing this relationship or describing this relationship he has with this young peasant girl. And they're in the early stages of their relationship. Now, some of you who have a Bible background are going to say, wait a second. I thought Solomon was the guy who had 700 wives and 700 concubines on the side. We're going to learn relationships from him. And if you're saying that, I'm with you. Like, I just, I don't know if that's the best way to go about things. Some of you might be going, 700 wives, that's not a bad idea, I think, you know. But here's the deal. Back then, politically speaking, kings would take on wives that were daughters of other kings. Sometimes there would would never be much of a relationship there at all. It was just politically motivated to try to strengthen the relationship between kingdoms. But certainly there was some stuff going on there with 700 wives, 700 concubines that really wasn't part of God's, you know, ideal design for intimacy and marriage. But guess what? Solomon figures this out over time. In fact, he chronicles his realization in a book, in a journal called Ecclesiastes. That's in the Bible too. And you can read through that and you can see that he, he spent a bunch of money and he's like, ah, that's really not where you get fulfillment. And, and, uh, and, and you can do all kind, you can have all kinds of success. And he goes, ah, oh, that's not my, and he talks about exploits with women. And he says, that's not where it is. So basically he's going to say, don't do as I did, do as God says. And so what God does is gives him a second chance. He, uh, forgives him and now that he's kind of has a second chance at love with this young peasant girl and that's what the song of solomon is about and can we push pause just for a second and say this how cool is it that god is a god of second chances how cool is it that we can be a people that uh, you know no matter what i've done no matter what relational mistakes i've made or how things have been blown in the past that God can give me a second chance and give me a hope in a future. I love that. All right, so let's look at uh, verse number two here. It says, uh, she is going to start talking, this young little peasant girl. She's going to start, and she says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Not a very subtle girl here, okay? Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. Do you guys remember your first kiss? Oh my goodness, I remember mine. It was this violent collision of braces and retainers and lips. It was was really traumatic. I wish I could forget it, but I can't. And uh, anyway, can I give you some fun facts just about kissing? Just just for fun, I mean, I'm studying this stuff. I'll share it with you. Uh, Dr. Yale Vernardo did a study that says that kissing actually develops your immune system because you are passing germs back and forth with each other and your body will naturally increase antibodies, okay? So here's the deal. We're coming into the cold and flu season. 
I suggest you go home, you, this is your, you grab some Zycam, all right? Or, and, and you go up and you just, you, you come where your, your spouse can see you, and you just take that Zycam, you throw it in the garbage, and you say, how you doing? <laughs> like, you know, you want to stay healthy, let's do this. Here's another one. As you sit there right now, experts say that at rest, you'll burn about one calorie per minute. But if you're kissing, you will burn three calories per minute. And some people can even achieve a four calorie kiss. All right? Just give you something to shoot for. Okay? Let's move on because I'm getting uncomfortable. All right. Verse number three. Pleasing is the fragrance of your perfumes. Your name is like perfume poured out. No wonder the young women love you. She's talking about how great this guy smells. And I think there's something to that. I think you guys should invest in a little cologne, all right? Or if you go home today and your cologne has the word musk or brute in it, let me just say, you're not doing yourself any favors, all right? Just get rid of that stuff. But there is something of substance in this verse. It's not just about the way you kiss or the way you smell. She says, your name is like perfume. It's not just about the way you smell or the way you kiss or the way you look. It's not just about the Porsche you drive or the success you've had in this world, but it's your name. And the Greek word here, the Hebrew word here is karasso. It is literally the word for having something etched, right? Like it's not, uh, it's not an ink that will fade, but it's etched into you. And she's talking about his character. She's talking about his name, his reputation. If you've ever had a bad reputation, you know how etched that is and how hard it is to change that. She's saying beyond kissing and the way you smell and the way you look, and I love who you are. God has etched himself into who you are, and it spills over. It's not just a religion for you. It's not just a one hour on Sunday thing for you. Man, the way you talk to people, the way that you, the way that you uh, trade with integrity in your business, the way you love people, the way you forgive, the way you honor God that's etched in you and your name is so attractive to me. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? It says uh, in, in, uh, in uh, 1 Timothy 4.8, it says, For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both this present life and the life to come. He's saying there, it's okay to hit the gym, fellas, and go there and work on your biceps and your triceps and your pecs and your abs. As long as you understand that one day those abs are going to turn into, or that six-pack is going to turn into a two-liter, Okay. <laughs> And then what are you left with? You need to be a man of character. You need to be a man where God has etched himself on your reputation and on your very soul. You know, one way to apply this might just be for us to go home. Uh, maybe after kids are going to bed or maybe you're still dating and you're going to a restaurant here and, and you just sit where you're un, undistracted and you just say, hey, you know what? Is there anything about my carasso? <laughs> Is there anything about my character that is unattractive to you? And then just shut up, right? And then just, just don't, just let them say whatever they're going to say and don't turn it back on them and don't try to defend yourself and don't say, well, yeah, but you, like, no, just hear it and write it down. Some of you are going to be there for a long time, you know, <laughs> but just write it down and then over the next day or two days, just pray and just say, God, is there any truth to this? God, is there any part of who I am? Search my thoughts, God, and know my ways, God. Is there anything about this that I need to change? Because I want to be somebody whose carasso, whose character is attractive to other people. All right. She continues in verse 4, take me away with you. Let us hurry. Let the king bring me into his chambers. Wow, she is not mincing words here. Uh, it's getting a little warm in the room. And uh, here's the deal. There's this misnomer out there that Christians are, are kind of boring, you know, that there's not a lot of passion 
in a Christian relationship. Uh, that, you know, once your, once your wife starts going to church and stuff, well, that's really going to impact the intimacy, and that's just not... Can I just say something to you? There was a study done by University of Chicago. University of Chicago. It's not me that did the study, okay, with a couple of my friends. This is one of the largest secular studies of S-E-X anywhere in our country. And it says that Christian people have the best sex life in this country. You go look it up and you read it. And you can read the details. I'm not sharing the details with you because some of you and I, we have just met and it would get awkward, okay? But go read it. It's amazing to me. All right. We rejoice and delight in you. We will praise your love more than wine. These are the daughters of Jerusalem. These are her friends talking about their relationship, just going, man, your relationship is amazing. This guy is awesome. And, and maybe this is a little, a little clue here in the Bible that if you are sitting around, ladies, and uh, I don't know, with your friends and you're painting your nails and you're eating some ice cream and you're just kind of like talking about your relationship, if your girlfriends are going, sweetheart, he is not right for you. This guy is trouble. He is a player. You should probably listen to some of that. You know, these girls are just all for this relationship. When it's so wonderful to come as someone who, you know, I'll, I'll perform a wedding. It is so great when everybody present is just going, yes, this is right. It's so much more distracting. It's so much more scary when you have the dad or the mom or the sister who's just going, this is a train wreck. So... I just offer that up to you, beware. Okay, now she, the girl, the peasant girl, is gonna talk about herself and not about the guy. And she says, dark am I, yet lovely, daughters of Jerusalem. Dark like the tents of Kadar. The tents of Kadar uh, were black, jet black, because they were made of goat hair back then. That's four years of seminary to be able to tell you that, okay? Like the tent curtains of Solomon. Do not stare at me because I'm dark, because I'm darkened by the sun. My mother's sons were angry with me. My brothers were angry with me and made me take care of the vineyards, my own vineyard I had to neglect. Now, in our day, we'll do everything to get that golden brown skin, right? There are people out there risking skin cancer to try to get a little darker. There are those who are paying hundreds of dollars for fake tans because that's beautiful, in our culture. Back here, it was a little bit different. Back then, uh, people that were darker skinned were that way because they had to work out in the fields. They were usually the workers. They were usually the, 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 the lower class people in that culture. But the people that were of lighter skin were so because they had other people to do that work for them. And so that culture developed that the lighter your skin, the more attractive it was. And she's coming to him and saying, listen, my brothers made me go out and work them fields. I'm sorry. I got a farmer's tan here, and I'm sorry about that. But watch what she does. I mean, she says, dark am I. She flips it. She says, dark am I, yet lovely. Yeah, I've had to work out in the field, but I'm beautiful. She has got this inner confidence that, guys, this is so, or I should say gals, this is so attractive to us. Confidence. This idea that I'm not obsessed about the way I look. I'm not so insecure that I have to, you know, look at myself in the mirror all the time and I can never go out without makeup and, and I'm always fishing for compliments. Oh, these shoes just look, I look horrible in these pants and oh, I just, what do you think? You know, that is, that is not attractive. You know what's cool? This verse, Proverbs 31 30 says, Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. I, I just love it when a woman can say, uh, God loves me. That's why I'm valuable. My God created me with this hair and this skin and these eyes and these lips and I'm happy with my... I, God created me. He loves me. And so I don't need to, to get my security or my self-esteem from some guy or from some 20 guys because I get it from the Lord. Guys, Jerry Maguire, great movie, loved it. 
but he's got it wrong. No man can complete you. Jesus completes you. And then when he does, you become this confident, full, whole person that becomes so attractive. 1 Peter 3.3 says, Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. Maya Angelou wrote, A woman's heart should be so hidden in Christ that a man should have to seek Christ to find her. That a woman's heart should be so tied up in Jesus. She's so close to him. Her, her relationship with him is so tight that a man is going to have to seek Jesus, get around Jesus, get to know Jesus if he's ever going to discover her. I think that's beautiful. All right, verse 9. Uh, verse 9, he starts talking. Solomon starts talking to the young peasant girl, and he says, I liken you, my darling, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariot horses. Now, the word darling there uh, really should be translated um, friend. It's really more of a, this, you know, friendship relationship. And I don't know about you, but some of the best marriages I've ever seen have come from people who were first just great friends, you know? People that would say, I'm not trying to get anything from you. I just enjoy hanging out with you. I love your personality. I love the, your, you know, mentally, we just, you challenge me. I, I love we can talk about things. You're a bright person, you know. Said, We're good friends. And that's what he's saying to her. And then he goes on. I liken you, my darling, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariot horses. He does call her a horse here. <laughs> There's really no denying it. Um, and, and I don't know that I can really endorse you going home and calling your wife a horse. I don't think it would go well. Unless your wife is familiar with 3,000-year-old Egyptian war tactics. Because if she is, she would understand that Pharaoh's chariot horses were all stallions, male horses. And he would line them up and they would be well organized and they would march out to the enemy. And the people are back there whipping the horses and the guys have got their swords and their stuff. And the horses are just, you know, breathing and they're all and they're galloping. I'm going to go get those guys. We're going to go get those guys. The foreign nations figured out that one of the tactics they could use was they would release a herd of mares, female horses, to run across the battlefield. And those horses, the stallions, would be like, gallop, gallop, I'm going to get it, I'm going to get it. Ooh, who's that? <laughs> and literally, it would mess up the line. The stallions, as they were in full stride, would start going this way. Some of them would keep going, some of them, and they would crash. It was just like, a, it was a war tactic. And so now what this guy is saying to this young peasant girl is, man, you distract me. I'm focused on this, but you. And now maybe it makes more sense. Because now your husband can say, listen, I don't care if I'm focused on work. I don't care if my guys are calling saying, let's go fishing. I don't care if the U of M game is on. When you come into a room, honey, everything else stops. And you distract me from anything else. And my focus goes on you. You walk into a room of a thousand people and everybody else just fades into a blur. And you, honey, are the one that I just can't take my eyes off of. And some of you ladies are like, I want to be a horse. I want to be a horse. I want to be a horse. <laughs> right? Verse 10. Your cheeks are beautiful with earrings, he says. Your neck with strings of jewels. We will make your earrings of gold and studded silver. He's like, I'm going to do everything I can to give you everything because I love you so much. But here's what he's saying. Besides the jewelry, he's complimenting her on her physical beauty. And he, he starts with her cheeks. And then he goes, you can watch it down to, his, to her neck. And you'll notice the downward trend here. And you'll also notice that he stops because they're not married yet. And this is a man 
who understands that God has designed things in an orderly way and that God has designed things to happen at just the right time and in just the right season and that to rush things, well, you skip over just some great stuff. This is a guy that understands we're not going to rush into intimacy. We're not going to rush it. Have you ever met people that, I mean, even beyond intimacy, that they just jump into the relationship? You ever seen people that they're so desperate, they're so uh, uh, insecure, they're so looking for somebody to complete them that they'll jump after? I mean, it's not about Mr. Right. It's about Mr. Right now. And if you've got a pulse and you show any interest in me, then, oh, my goodness, you're going to make all my troubles go away. I'll finally have self-esteem. I'll finally like myself. And people will just, they'll say, I love you on the first date. They'll say, let's talk about getting married. They'll say, I, I want to, I think, you know what I'm talking about, right? We've all had friends that have done this. It's not us. It's friends, right? And, and intimacy is a part of that. I mean, certainly God has created intimacy to be, I mean, literally, we could talk about how chemicals are released in the midst of sex, which cause people to bind together, I mean, like to emotionally and mentally just come together and become one. And certainly when we're doing that too early and outside the covenant of and that commitment of marriage, it can really mess up relationships. And the truth is, outside of religion and God, you've probably seen that happen too. And so I think one of the things that we could take away from this is just to understand that even if it's in the early part of a relationship, don't rush it. Maybe what we should do is, is we're going to end here. Come back, because we'll, we'll talk more about marriage and parenting. And, but maybe we should end at this stage of the relationship and just think about that intensity. You know that intensity where you just, you just want to be with that person. I don't want You occupy my thoughts. You occupy my dreams. You're all I want to talk about. And you're, I always want to be with you. You guys remember it. Some of you are in that stage right now. Some of you can remember that stage in that relationship. And maybe it's a good time to just stop right there and shift to this wonderful metaphor in the Bible where Jesus is talked about as a bridegroom and the church, the people, us, are talked about as the bride. And for us to understand that if, if we really, if we really understood the kind of relationship we're supposed to have with Jesus. We're supposed to have that kind of intensity where I, he occupies my thoughts and he occupies my dreams and, and my priorities shift because of him. And, and I just, I want to tell you about, I want to tell you about this relationship I have because it's amazing. Jesus has changed my life. For those who've never been in that sort of intense romantic relationship, they just don't get it, do they, right? And if you've never been in that intense relationship with Jesus, it's just hard to understand. You look at people and you go, what are you, you're a fanatic. What is this? 